no matter what's going on around you. It's a community. Everyone is accepted and loving in this little mile strip. You gotta keep doing you, baby. We need to do something to make everyone feel accepted and loved. I've been working real hard to get up, get out and do something with this gift God gave me. You're the reason why they made me. You can make a difference. You can just, if you're just good to other people. June is Pride Month. It's a month for celebration, it's a month for parades, it's a month for festivals, and it is a month for reflection. For the next half hour, Arizona's family is recognizing and honoring various LGBTQ plus voices in our community. See the impact and changes happening across Arizona as Arizona's family celebrates Pride. Hello and thanks for joining us as Arizona's family celebrates Pride. It is a special time for members of the Pride community around the world and of course right here in the Valley. And from state government to local hangouts, this community is making a real difference even if it's not always obvious. We want to start our show by featuring two Valley designers. It's right up here, Allie. Mm -hmm. Sergio Aragon and Jesus Gutierrez are the creators of the clothing line Gay Pride Apparel. Yeah, we love local businesses and they made their clothing so that they could show off their pride all year long, not just in June. And as Arizona's family's Jason Berry shows us, you can now find Gay Pride Apparel in Walmarts across the country. Sergio Aragon and Jesus Gutierrez have been best friends since grade school, growing up in Maryvale with big dreams about making a difference. They weren't quite sure what their mission in life was until a few years ago, when the two gay men created their own line of clothing and accessories called Gay Pride Apparel. We came from 51st and Indian School, and now look at us taking this car here in New York City with you all, like it's, it's literally a dream come yeah. true. The savvy business owners noticed all the fanfare and celebrations surrounding Pride Month every June when cities across the country recognize the LGBTQ community. But then it goes away. June 1st comes up and every single store, every single sidewalk has a rainbow. But then July 1st comes and then it's like all washed out. The Arizona entrepreneurs believe the LGBTQ community should have a way to show their pride year round. So they came up with a line of products designed to celebrate and empower the LGBTQ community year round. We're like, we need to do something to make everyone feel accepted and loved in our community. Yeah. And the pledge to spread the love just got a much wider audience. Retail giant Walmart has just launched an exclusive collection of gay pride apparel that is now available in stores nationwide. Walking into a store and seeing you know, two gay men plastered on the, on the little display with all of our products, um, I think it's very special too. The businessmen are especially excited about having their products on display in their hometown Walmart stores back in Phoenix, where all their friends and family can see them. They're all so excited to see like, you know, their kids, their grown up yeah. kids now, uh, in a Walmart store, which is such a big accomplishment. Sure, all the attention is nice, but Oregon and Gutierrez say the best part of having their gay pride products go national is the acceptance that comes with it. I hope that, you know, someone out there can finally feel seen by walking into their Walmart with their parents or by themselves, um, you know, look, look, going for grocery shopping. To acknowledge our history, we've come a long way as a, as a queer community. Jason Berry for Arizona's family. It was just 10 years ago when gay marriage became legal here in Arizona, changing and bettering the lives of gay couples in our state. But where does Arizona stand now compared to how things were a decade ago? Arizona's family political reporter Dennis Welch looks at some of the progress in the gay community. No, I was a good gay. Former Democratic state lawmaker Ken Chevron, Arizona's first openly gay lawmaker elected to the state house in 1994. And by being, quote, a good gay, he says he means he didn't go out of his way to be confrontational. My attitude was I tried to, for at least the first four years, just let them know who I was, who my partner was, and not feeling threatened, but feeling taking the time to get to know me as a person. Chevron says it wasn't easy. 30 years ago, homophobic views were widely accepted in society and in politics. After getting into office, Chevron recalled a lawmaker who openly talked about rounding up AIDS patients and placing them in camps. 
The same year he was first elected, the Democratic nominee for governor, Eddie Basha, lost in large part because he supported gay marriage. Who would have ever thought of gay marriage that would be you know, possible in my lifetime? That wasn't something that many of us pushed for because it didn't seem even something realistic. Beyond same-sex marriage, archaic laws that once criminalized gay lifestyles were taken off the books. At the same time, gays and lesbians have become far more welcome into our daily lives and culture, but he worries the state could be sliding backwards. I think it's pretty disheartening. I, we worked so hard to get where we're at. Last year, advocates accused former Governor Doug Ducey of signing several pieces of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. This year, Republicans have authored bills targeting drag shows and the trans community. As expected, current Governor Katie Hobbs has vetoed all of those proposals. You even have an openly gay legislator who's Republican who votes for all this stuff. The lawmaker he's referring to, Ducey's former budget director and current state representative from Phoenix, Matt Grass. I'm welcome in the GOP. I'm welcome in the House GOP caucus. In fact, I would tell you that I get more flack from gay people for being Republican than I do from Republicans for being gay. This year, Gress voted for legislation that would have banned school teachers and employees from using preferred pronouns, forced schools to provide separate bathrooms for transgender students, and heavily regulate drag shows. Gress believes the bills seen by many as anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ+, would have empowered parents and protected students. At the end of the day, there are some deeply disturbing ideas out there um, about um, you know, allowing minors to have sex change operations, uh, uh, among other things. That's just not where the vast majority of Americans and Arizonans are right now. The Phoenix lawmaker doesn't think he or the GOP are targeting the transgender community. But Chevron disagrees. He's convinced the party is using the same attacks against them as it did against gay and lesbians back in the early 1990s. This is a community that is probably more alienated than any other community, the trans community. And ultimately, who are they hurting? just getting started with our Arizona's family celebrates pride special coming up after the break it is believed to be the only remaining lesbian bar in Arizona we talked to the owner about what makes this popular hangout so special and we visit with a valley artist whose work can be found across the state and the country he talks about his inspiring life journey and discusses some of his artwork Arizona's family's pride special we'll be right back Arizona's family continues celebrating pride here in our state, we want to take a moment to look at some other pride celebrations around the world. For Arizona's family, I'm Suzanne Bissett. We start in the former Soviet state of Moldova. Early this month, members of the country's LGBTQIA community paraded through the streets and for the first time there was no need for excessive police protection. Since 2020, the Moldovian government has tried to be more accepting of gay rights. Meanwhile, in Vienna, Austria, police say their special forces prevented a planned attack on pride marchers in that city. Three people were arrested, but the celebration didn't stop for the 300,000 people in attendance. And in Lisbon, Portugal, people celebrated with a parade, bands, and a pub crawl. The first official Lisbon Pride event was in 1997 and has grown into Portugal's largest gay pride event. Unlike many other cities, the festivities in Lisbon stretch across two weekends. Arizona's family celebrates pride. We are exploring and celebrating the impact the pride community has made right here in Arizona. But first, we want to give you a little history about Pride Month. The reason it takes place in June is to mark the anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. The New York bar was popular with the gay pride community, and it was raided by police on June 28, 1969. On the anniversary, a year later, people marched through the streets of Manhattan 
And that is considered to be the first gay pride event. And now for our next story, I met with the owner of Boycott Bar in Phoenix's Melrose District. It is believed to be the last lesbian bar in Arizona and one of only a handful left in our country. We find out why lesbian bars are dwindling and how this hometown girl is dedicated to creating a safe space in her community. Let's be honest, there's a ton of gay bars around. There wasn't a place for women to go get dressed up. And that first event, how did that go for you? We had 452 people. I was like, ah, we got something. And got something she did. 19 years ago, Audrey Corley started throwing parties for the lesbian community. I went to one of my friends who owned a bar, a restaurant on 7th Street, which is now Hula's. But at the time it was called BZ Grill. And I was like, hey, I got this party and I think it'd be great. You know, can you give me a chance? And it just kind of grew and grew. And grow it did. I always wanted to be in Melrose. Enough for Audrey to open her own place, first in Glendale. And it's been great. I love it. And now in Phoenix's prominently gay Melrose District. I think it's a gay neighborhood. I mean, look, at we even got the gay crosswalk right out there. So I think it's a great space where people feel comfortable. And it's not even just a neighborhood. It's a community. It's a whole different community. And everyone is accepting and loving in this little mile strip. Because that's really what it is. They call it the Melrose Mile. And it's a great community. We got Short Leash, we got Retro Ranch, we have all them. Great restaurants, you know, like I said, Progress, the Valentine, all these are great. I love our community, so it's home. And Phoenix is her home. Corley is a Valley native, a hometown girl. I'm like the true story, you know, I come from West Phoenix. I went to Carl Hayden High School, Isaac Junior High, and I went to college. And I had great mentors and people and a great family who supported me and that makes all the difference. She credits her time playing basketball at Phoenix College, and when she got hurt, she became assistant coach and sticks to that coaching mentality in her bar and in her community. The first team that I was at at Phoenix College changed my whole life and put me on the direction that I needed to be. Boycott Bar is getting a lot of national attention as of late. Roku featured the bar in a series called The Lesbian Bar Project. Salud! The docu-series says in 1980, there were 200 lesbian bars in America, and that number's now dwindled to just 21. People always ask, why is that? And a lot of things have happened throughout technology in the years. We've become more inclusive and, and more accepted, right? It's been, you could, we feel free to go to certain places now, whereas before you kind of just had to hide in your one little space, back in when I was coming out. Audrey says Boycott Bar is the only lesbian bar in Arizona. Sometimes it's heavy, right? Because you know they can. You have people online that are like, "Oh, this and that." It's not always busy. No, it's not always busy. But I don't know a place that always is busy, if we're being honest, right? But we are always welcoming, and we are always a space, and our doors are always open except Mondays. So I get it. You know, we're never going to be the busiest place, but we are a place for people, and it's a safe place. And for Audrey, she says she'd rather her bar be always safe than always busy. Boycott Bar to me is actually a place for people. It means we boycott the norm. We're a place where people can come and be who they want to be. Regardless of what you think, gender, race, anyone, you're welcome here. A lot's more ahead in our special, including a profile on a Valley organization dedicating to helping LGBTQ youth in foster care. When we return, see how many young lives have been improved thanks to this group's contributions. Welcome back to Arizona's Family Celebrates Pride. While there is still much discrimination in society toward the LGBTQ plus community, there's also a lot of signs of progress, including how Pride Month is celebrated in government. In the past, homosexuals were persecuted and jailed, but now Pride Month is being embraced by some politicians. Earlier this month, President Joe Biden held a Pride Month celebration on the White House lawn. And here in Arizona, Governor Katie Hobbs displayed four pride flags around the executive tower to celebrate the start of Pride Month. Now, being in foster care is no easy go. Now imagine being an LGBTQ youth feeling out of place in a foster home that can be chaotic and filled with uncertainty. That's where Mulligan's Manor comes in. It's one of the few foster homes in the country that caters to gay youth, promoting self-expression, self-acceptance, development, and healthy life choices. <laughs> Mm. 
Mulligan's Manor is one of a kind when it comes to foster homes in Arizona. I feel like Mulligan's Manor has carved out a space in the LGBTQ community that wasn't here before. Joseph Cavanaugh is one of the volunteers of this group home that is open to all foster kids in Arizona, but has a focus on LGBTQ plus youth. Well, I had a really hard story when I came out and um, my heart was hurt. Cavanaugh says he can relate, in a way, to kids who come to this state certified group home. Some with very tough stories of parents who rejected and even abused their children and teens after finding out they were gay, lesbian, or trans. A lot of the kids have parents who cannot accept who, them for who they are. Jenny Diaz started Mulligan's Manor 15 years ago. She's a therapist and has worked in the foster care world for a while. After seeing LGBTQ youth struggle in foster homes and even be the target of harassment and violence, she knew she needed to create a space where they could thrive. A lot of times they come to us with nothing but the clothes on their backs and that's really hard. Here they get clothing, food, guidance, and resources with an emphasis on self-worth and self-acceptance. So I was placed in the foster care system because my mother did not want me back either. State law prohibits us from showing pictures or video of foster youth, but Venus, a 17-year-old who lives at Mulligan's Manor, says the support system here has turned her turbulent life around. But now that I have therapy, medication, a support system. I now have a part-time job and I have straight A's in my classes. Dia says there's many success stories here, helping foster youth heal trauma and realize the wants and dreams every kid deserves. There's so many kids that have come and gone that have made better lives for themselves. Um, I'm very proud, one of my kids is a judge, another kid is a nurse practitioner. Much more to come as we are celebrating Pride Month right here on Arizona's Family. When we return, we visit with a local artist making a statement with his artwork. Find out what inspires him when Arizona's Family celebrates Pride returns. As we wrap up our celebration of Pride Month, we wanted to visit with a Valley artist, Christopher Jagman. His artwork is colorful and creative, provocative and powerful. Arizona's family's Daryl Cunningham met with him at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, where some of his work is on display. A content warning. This story contains a homosexual slur that some may find offensive. There's some heroes of mine that yeah. I've like looked at forever. I knew when I was an artist when I was really young, probably five or six. I remember going under my grandmother's dining room table and just coloring or drawing. And I now consider that my first studio because I would be all alone. I, I'm the oldest of seven and um, it was a very chaotic house. So it was my, my time for peace and quiet. I love chaos in a controlled way. I love my family chaos. Um, and it just kind of calmed me to hear other noise, to hear the, the laughing or um, just kids playing in the house. Um, it was really nice. Now I use the chaos of the world to kind of make my art and I try to sit back and reflect on it and just be quiet in it, um, find some uh, mindfulness in that chaos and make work from that. Words started happening in my, my work um, from comic strips actually. Um, and the funny words that they use. But in 2016, I was painting and I wasn't painting anything with words on it at, at all. And I would listen to the news of the election at that time. And I remember just the, the words that were said during that, um, that moment in time, and they were terrible. Uh, I was always taught to be polite to someone, to apologize and to be kind. And this world was not the world that I liked. And so words came from that. I would listen to what they said and how they said it is even more important sometimes. How politicians use word, words to twist around an idea and make it their own. Um, so I want to claim back some of those words for myself. I was making work where I would kind of list names that I was called through my life. Just things that politicians were saying about me as a queer person, what those words were and just 
saying the same words, but being proud of what those words meant and use it in a different way because they were meant to instill fear in people. But I wanted to say it's not, you don't have to be afraid of these words. This is who I am. Smoka is really a great place to come and I always admire the work that they show. It's, it's a little challenging sometimes for people and um, my work is challenging. So I want to be a part of it and I'm grateful to the museum for allowing my work here. Uh, it's been a thrill. I, sh I bring people here all the time. I think people can relate to my work. This, for instance, is, uh, is using label making tape, a common object that you find in your house. And I just uh, started typing out, I'm okay, everything's fine, everything's gonna be good. And it was a way to calm me down. Um, some people say mantras a lot. Like in the morning, I'll say like, this is gonna be a great day today. This is something here. Like these are beautifully typed and um, I keep the mistakes in there, so it shows that I'm a real person too, that we all make mistakes and we all have um, our own kind of problems. I've made this four times at various museums and galleries, and each time it's different. It's just, it's just done on site. It took me four days to do this, and it's really calming and soothing for me to do that, even though my fingers hurt from pushing all the push pins. I wanna talk about this piece, what inspired it, what, did, what does it mean to you? Right. Yeah, so um, I'm really concerned about the U.S. Constitution. People use it for their own benefit, you know, whether they're, they believe things about the Constitution that may or may not be true. So I um, heard about this language that was used in the 1940s through the 1950s in England called Polari, and it's just a translation of um, kind of basic common words that were used by gay men um, at the time to know that the other person was gay, to know that they were like-minded. I just wanted to show that the Constitution is for all of us, every one of us, no matter how um, small of a person, no matter like what their, their gender is, no matter what their race is, it belongs to all of us. We've talked a lot about your artwork and how you use words, and we've talked about how much words have power. And what I'm looking at here is how you've taken two words that have a positive and a negative, and you've turned them into to art. Right, so I was called Chrissy by my mother, my grandmother, and my aunts. They were my three favorite people in the world, and they always called me that. And one day my mother came to school, and she called me Chrissy in front of my classmates, and um, there was a young boy, I'll never forget his face, who called me a faggot after that. And so I was teased for quite a while about being called Chrissy, and all of a sudden that beautiful name that I loved turned into something terrible. And so I took those words and made them art by reflecting Chrissy and Faggot as a way that um, it shows that these are who I am. At the same time, I kind of fought against them. And now I'm kind of trying to bring them back in my life. I'll take both of them. What do you want people to take away from your art? I just want people to see that it's, it's gonna be okay. It's not that easy. You have to get through the next day and you have to work at it. It's, it's like that saying like, well, it's all good. Or there's another pe saying that people say like, it's out of my hands. It isn't out of your hands. You can make a difference. You can just, if you're just good to other people, that's all I want. I want people to think like, oh, I can just be nice to that person. It doesn't take a lot. Thank you for joining us for Arizona's Family Celebrates Pride. We've enjoyed sharing these positive stories from the LGBTQ plus community right here in Arizona. And although June is the official month designated to show your pride, we hope that the spirit of unity and equality resonate throughout the year. Thanks for joining us.